Hello and welcome to episode 28 of the Abbasid History Podcast, an audio platform to examine pre-modern Islamic Islamic history and a global medieval past. We are sponsored by IHRC Bookshop. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact IHRC Bookshop for details. We are also sponsored by Turath Publishing. Buy now an introduction to Sahih al-Bukhari by Mustafa al-Azami. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit Turath Publishing at turath.co.uk and use discount code POD15 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact Turath Publishing for details. I'm your host, Al-Hassan, PhD student at the School of Oriental African Studies in London. Now onto the show. Considered by Sunni Muslims as the second most authentic book after the Qur'an, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari's collection of the Prophet's sayings and traditions, or hadith, holds an esteemed station in Sunni scholasticism. To discuss with me the life, works and legacy of al-Bukhari is Dr. Jonathan Brown. Dr. Brown is the Al-Walid bin Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization and School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. His PhD title and first book was The Canonization of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, The Formation and Function of the Sunni Hadith Canon. Welcome, Dr. Brown. Hey, how are you doing? Al-Bukhari was born in 810 Common Era in present-day Uzbekistan, almost 60 years after the Abbasid Revolution, just after the passing of the fabled Caliph Harun al-Rashid and the start of the Fourth Fitna civil war between his two sons, Al-Amin and Al-Ma'mun. What do we know about his socio-political and cultural context and what impact would it have on his formation as a scholar? Um, well, first of all, I'm a big fan. So I'm uh, I'm really honored to be on, and it's nice to meet you know talk to you in person. You're you're doing this interview like 15 years too late. I, mean, I wrote this book uh, so long ago. I've had to go back and read reread sections of it. There's nothing worse than like realizing you're not going to be able to give a good presentation of something that you actually wrote. But I've also been um, tr- I'm translating Sahih Bukhari with like a commentary and I'm about about a halfway through the book. And so in some ways, my contact with uh, Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari is more intimate now than it ever was, but also, but it's more like with his actual book uh, than with, you know, the, the, the study I did it from, you know, many years ago. But I'll, anyway, so I'll do my best to answer your questions. In some ways, I, I feel like his political con- and social context has no impact on him. I mean, I I know a lot of, I think a lot of people who've experienced or sort of engaging with Islamic thought know this, which is that in, in a lot of ways, these these people sort of, these, they're almost like these disembodied brains that sort of float around through time and space. Uh, they interact in this, with this life of the mind and this kind of diachronic republic of letters where they're commenting on someone a hundred years before them and in another a thousand miles away, and that person is more immediate to them than what's going on around them. I mean, in some ways, you you know, you you read Sahih Bukhari or almost any other book, um, and I you know, I'd say maybe most books written by Muslim scholars, you you wouldn't actually know what their context is at all from the book. I mean, like for example, the Fatawa Hindia or the Fatawa Alamgiri. I mean, you read you read this, and it, you might not you you wouldn't know it was written in India. There's some in some ways Sahih Bukhari. And his writings are extremely contextually influenced. And in, in a lot of ways, I think Bukhari was more contextually embedded than other authors. But in some ways, he's not at all contextually embedded. So when we think about context in the kind of you know Western his- history, we think about political context. You know, what was so-and-so ruler doing or, or not doing? And that stuff I don't think mattered to Bukhari at all. I think it had very little influence on his on his work. I think it influenced his life, but not his work. What influenced his work was the very specific theological and legal debates going on with other Muslim scholars at the time. And Sahih Bukhari, it's like reading a. Um, I mean, I don't want to in- insult the book by saying this, but it's it's almost like reading a really snarky, like hipster movie review or something, like where. 
you know, there's all these allusions to something that just happened in some other movie reviewer who the guy doesn't like, who may or said, to, but who doesn't get referred to by their name. But it, but anybody. So if you were if you were reading that movie review in exactly that month and exactly that year, you would know, oh, my God, he just went there. He just said this. He just said that. Right. But if you're even a year or 10 years removed from that, you're going to be, what the heck is going on here? I mean, what is he talking about? Why is he writing this? So Sahih Bukhari is a, a book that if you read it, and also Bukhari's other books to a lesser extent, if you, if you read it, it's it's like incredible inside baseball or you know inside cricket or something for UK people. He's engaging in all these different debates that he never talks about explicitly or very rarely talks about explicitly. And it's only the kind of generation of commentators after him who sort of try to delve into this and figure out what what is he talking about here? Why does he say this? Why does he say that? But the book is still very, very elliptical, very cryptic. So that's why I mean he's extremely contextually embedded. But I'd say that the contextual embedding is a much more theological and legal debate. You know, the, the kind of two biggest things, right, are starting with the least less less significant one is the debate between the Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah, right? So Bukhari in some of his books talks about the Ahlul Sunnah. His student, a Tirmidhi, in his Sunan uses the phrase, and I think it's the earliest use of the phrase that anyone knows of. Tirmidhi uses the phrase, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people of the Sunnah and the collective. This is the group that Bukhari identifies with, uh, the kind of initial core of what the, the Ahlul Hadith that later matures into and splits into the the, the Shafi school of law and the, the Hanbali school of law. And so there's a debate between them and what they would and we would call the Ahlul Ra'i, the kind of people of, of opinion or you know, rational argumentation and law. And this is associated with Kufa and, of course, with Abu Hanifa. So th- this is a, the one group that that he his school of thought, his network of, of peers is opposed to and is always debating. And you see this in his Sahih. He has a very politely refers to Abu Hanifa as a certain person. I don't think he ever says Abu Hanifa's name exactly, but in his another one of his books, that's a re- refutation of the Hanafi position on not raising your hands in prayer when you come up from bowing to raise your hands in prayer. He has a whole book of, against that. And he talks about, I mean, in, in a in very severe language, about a person, I'll, I'll read you because it's really shocking. He said it's a rebuttal of of him, this person, him who rejected raising the hands to the head before bowing in prayer, and misleads the non Arabs, the Ajam, on this issue, turning his back on the Sunnah of the Prophet and those who have followed him. He says that this person, which is Abu Hanifa, did it quote out of the constructive rancor of his heart, breaking with the practice of the messenger of God, disparaging what he transmitted out of arrogance and enmity for the people of the Sunnah, for heretical innovation and religion, has tarnished his flesh, bones, and mind, and made him revel in the non-Arabs' deluded celebration of him. (laughs) This is, uh, wow. So Bukhari is generally very polite. MashaAllah, very polite person. Rahimahullah. But this, he could not constrain himself here. He had to, he couldn't contain himself. He gave his opinion. That's a, a, a debate over whether you raise your hands or not in prayer. And if you, as you listening, think, how can that be a serious debate? That's a, such a silly thing. Well, two things. One, Muslims take how you pray, how you worship God very, very, very seriously. And they're extremely conservative about this because this is how God and the Prophet taught them to pray. And second, it's not really about that particular issue. It's about what it means for your view on the sources of law. So for someone like Bukhari, although Hanafis would, would disagree with this, and I think they, they have a point, I don't think that, that Bukhari should have been so hostile towards this, but they, they, Bukhari would see this as an indication that you reject hadiths from the Prophet as the most authoritative way to know what his sunnah is, what his precedent is. So that's one thing. The big first big debate is kind of against the Kufan school of law, basically the Han- becomes the Hanafis. And the second big debate is against the Muslim rationalists who would be referred to by their opponents as Mu'tazila or also Jahmis. You know, generally your your listeners may know about this, right? So basically these are Muslims 
uh, who are, you know, very, very pious Muslims, but they believe that, you know, they believe more in, in, in a kind of a rational God, in a, in a God that can be understood rationally and that uh, theology and beliefs about God have to be kind of reasoned and accessible to reason. So, you know, they would believe in free will because at least more Teslites would, because, you know, how can God punish you for something you do or don't do unless you have a choice? They would believe, for example, in um, that God is just, that he's constrained by reason and justice. They believe in the ability of reason to understand right and wrong in the world, independent of revelation. The the Jahmis, what would be called Jahmis, although they don't refer to themselves like this, and these are the people who would be le- who really led the the Mehna, the uh, the Inquisition from about 833 to 851 against what the the sort of nascent Sunni community, they the the Jahmis are really people like Bishr al Murisi, uh, Ibn Abi Duwad. These people really led this effort. They were even arguably even more rationalist, but I- ironically, in the sense that some of them didn't apparently didn't believe in free will at all. Like they almost had a mechanistic view of creation that like God was so rational, right, or so you know that that we can't even think of choice in the world. Like it has to, the, the world has to just kind of run mechanistically. What happens is this sort of Muslim rationalist camp gets uh, very close to the Abbasid caliphs during the reign of Al-Ma'mun. And uh, toward the end of his reign, he institutes this policy of basically bringing in Muslim scholars and asking them to say that the Quran is the created word of God. And uh, it, it seems also this is continued under his successor, Al, Al-Mu'tasim, and then under his successor, Al-Wathiq. And it seems like also some of, they, they, they also forced other positions on scholars like denying what's called Ru'yat al-Bari, so denying that you would see God on the Day of Judgment. And if, from a Muslim rationalist perspective, that makes sense because the idea, you can't think about God as something that can be seen as being in a body, as being visible, like God has to be completely, cannot be th- talked about in an anthropomorphic way at all. And whereas the, the the Sunnis said, you know, well, there's all these hadiths where the prophet talks about on the day of judgment, you'll see God like you're looking up at the full moon, uh, or you'll appear before God without any barrier between you and him. So, of course, we have to remember why they're doing this. It's not just that they're trying to be jerks, although they were jerks in this case, uh, you know, Working, working with the man to oppress the, the the poor Sunni scholars, you know they're they're engaged in a lot of debates with other re- religious and philosophical traditions in the Near East, especially Christians. And if if the the Quran talks about Jesus as kalima min rabbihi, right? That Jesus is a word from his Lord. And if you say that God's speech is eternal, then Jesus is eternal. And so a Christian would say, I told you, look, uh, we look, uh, Gospel of John, the beginning is there was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Right. So we agree with you. Jesus is the eternal word of God. Right. So the Mu'tazila, it seems like said, no, no, no. The words of God are not eternal. They're created. The Quran is created. And so it seems like that might be why they were so in- intent on promoting this position. But for the. Sunni is like, especially the, the, the teacher of Bukhari, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. This was very uh, alarming for two reasons. One, because they didn't believe that humans should engage in kind of speculative theology to begin with. So you shouldn't be thinking about like, oh, what's the nature of God's speech? You know, what's the nature of, uh, is it created or not created or what, you know? They said, no, 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 you just, God tells you. Uh, what he wants you to know, and you just say, Sama'na we hear and we obey. Human brains are not capable of understanding God's nature or speculating about it. The second reason is it it seems like that this also really threatened the Quran's like social place. There's this one very interesting episode where this uh, early Hanafi Mu'tazilite scholar, Ibn Aban, in the early uh, 800s, He's a judge, and he is a case between a Muslim and a, a Jewish person. And the judge asks the, the Muslim to swear by these words in the Quran. And the Jewish the litigant says, you know, I, I don't accept this oath because he's just swearing by this created thing. You guys think the Quran is created. So it's almost like this threatening the Quran's place. 
And also, as Abul Hassan al-Ashari talks about in his works, he says, you know, about a century later, he says that this is really similar to saying that the Quran is qawl al-bashar, right? It's just the word of a person. It, it is too close to saying that the Quran was, was human speech for Sunni sensibilities. So they really oppose this. So th- those were the big issues that uh, influenced Bukhari's life intellectually and also uh, influenced his life practically speaking because he at various points in his life is you know driven from places because someone doesn't like his particular view on something like this on this on these issues of the nature of God's speech. So it really had a big impact on his life. Al-Bukhari traveled extensively to collect hadith, including to the Levant and Egypt, and died in 870, common era, in his country of birth. Give our listeners an overview of his life before we look at his works and legacy. Yeah, so Bukhari is, and it, you know, it kind of going along that same theme of, of how weird and a kind of elusive context can be when you're looking at these figures. I mean, Bukhari is from Bukhara, but he's really not from there. I mean, he, he, he spends his entire, almost his entire life on the road studying and teaching and writing. So Bukhara is really only a place he grows up and he goes there at the end of his life. That's it, pretty much. Uh, he's from a, a wealthy family. One of his great-great-grandfather or something converted to Islam. Uh, he was almost certainly Zoroastrian before that. Bukhara at the time, according to Al-Istakhri, you know, writing about a century later, they were speaking Sogdian, which is a, a Iranian language, but not Persian. Something like Bukhari's student, Muslim bin al-Hajjaj from Nishapur, he would be speaking Persian. But Bukhari probably like when, you know, when Bukhari's mom was yelling at him and telling him, you know, to eat his porridge or whatever, she was probably yelling at him in, in Sogdian. In one narration of Sahih Bukhari, there is a, a thing where he actually uses a Persian word. It's extremely rare. I mean, this is the when I say context is elusive to these people, I mean, these are people who are either speaking Persian or language close to it, like Sogdian. And that's what language they yell at their kids in. And then they, you know, when they're stubbed their toe and curse and stuff, they curse in Sogdian. But their whole life intellectually is in Arabic, and they do not let on at all that there is anything else in the world besides the Arabic language. And very, very rarely do you see them ever break into or even acknowledge Persian or any other language. And so this really interesting place in one point in Sahih Bukhari, in one in the narration of Sahrani of Sahih Bukhari, he says, use the word ham, ham like also or like in Persian, you know, ham in, in wa ham on, you know, this like this and, and that. But otherwise, you just don't have any of this context. So he he grows up in Bukhara. He does Hajj at 16. So he's studying. Obviously, he learns Arabic. He learns with the local scholars in Bukhara. His family's a wealthy landowning family. Dehqan is what they're called, Persian for kind of landowners. And he, according to his secretary later on in life, he sur- supported himself by rental income from property his family owned. And he would get about... 500 dirhams a month for about 500 silver coins a month and i think that would be about you know according to what i know about i don't know a, chi- a chick a live chicken was three dirhams so you can you can calculate how many live chickens you can buy a month that i mean he could he could live comfortably right so but so he he, he basically was able to study and do whatever he wanted in his life uh, in terms of he didn't have to work a uh, Muslim, his student was also, you know, he rented out shops in Nishapur and he had like a shop he rented out. And that's how he made his money. So he, he travels throughout, first throughout one of Transoxiana and Khorasan region, the major cities of Khorasan, Balkh, Marv, Nishapur. Uh, then he goes to northern Iran to, to Ray, the great commercial sort of entrepot of Ray, where there's modern day Tehran, where there's a, a bunch of a kind of a network of very influential Hadith scholars, the, the Razi clan, Abu Hatsum Razi, Abu Zara Razi, Ibn Wara. He, of course, goes to, to, to Baghdad, the navel of the world, the center of the world, where he studies with, he meets and studies with one of his main influ- teachers, Ibn Hanbal, Ahmed Ibn Hanbal, the, the center, the, the center of the, the Sunni network, 
that time, the kind of the maybe the the center of gravity of the Sunni school of thought as it's coming, as it's taking shape. And he studies with Ibn Hanbal, he studies with, with uh, Yahya ibn Ma'in, another major hadith critic in Baghdad. He goes to Wasit, Kufa, Basra in southern Iraq. In Basra, he studies with the famous uh, hadith scholar Ali, Ali ibn al-Madini, who was one of the scholars who caved in in the Inquisition. I would have caved too. First day in there, I would have said, <laughs> I would have said, where do I sign? But this, uh, so I, you know, but these guys were really tough. But Ali Medini, he's one of the people who caved in. But Bukhari had immense respect for him. He said, I never considered myself small except in before Ali Ibn al-Madini. You know, this guy is a great Hadith scholar. Uh, he went to Mecca, obviously, for Hajj. He studied with Al-Humaydi there, also in Medina. He went to Egypt. He went to Syria and kind of northern Iraq as well, Al-Jazeera. Then uh, he, he also goes back to Nishapur. So he spends about five years toward the end of his life in Nishapur. And that's where he teaches one of the people who would become his, one of his most influential students, Muslim Ibn al-Hajjaj in Nishapuri. And at some point also, I'm not exactly sure where, maybe it was in Nishapur. He also teaches another student, very close student of his, who will continue his work and become very influential, uh, namely Abu Isa Tirmidhi, uh, died 892 of the Common Era, who wrote, the a famous Sunan as well. So then Nishapur, there's a one, there's a really big Hadith scholar in Nishapur named Muhammad ibn Yahya Dhuhli. And he's older than Bukhari. Uh, he dies around the same time, but he's much older than Bukhari. So he actually managed to study with some people that Bukhari was not able to meet, like Abdul Zak Sanani in, um, in Yemen. And he, it seems like, because when you have a figure like Bukhari, there's a sacred history that arises around him and you kind of have to look back at the earliest sources to figure out what's the kind of, what's his history before he, you get a lot of kind of stories spun around him. And it seems like something happens between Dhuhli and Bukhari. And it seems like Dhuhli, uh, Rahimahullah, does not, has a hard time dealing with people being his rival in Nishapur. He kind of, turns against and drives out Bukhari, and he turns and drive again and against and drives out Muslim as well, or at least doesn't drive him out, but kind of alienates him from a lot of people in Nishapur. The later on it would the story is that uh Dhuhli didn't like Bukhari's position on the nature of the Quran. And I should say this very quickly so Bukhari had a very reasonable position, which is that the Quran is the uncreated word of God, which is exactly what Sunni should say. But someone said, OK, well, when you recite the Quran or when you write the Quran, what about the sound that comes out of your mouth or the ink on the paper? And Bukhari said, well, those are created because human actions are created. This was another Sunni position, which is that a God creates people's actions. So when I lift my hand up, you know, God is creating that action. So but this seemed completely reasonable, right? Obviously, when I say, you know, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, like that, the actual sound coming out of my mouth, the vibrations in the air are created. Or when I write that with a pen, the ink and the paper is created. There was a kind of extremist, extreme part, extreme faction of the Ahl Hadith. George Maktasi calls them the ultra conservatives. I like the term uber Sunnis. Uber Sunni is like they had like a rock rock band or something, you know, <laughs> like some tattoos. I don't know. They were extremely hard. So they th their position would end up being rejected. So Bukhari was actually, if you go back and look in books of Aqidah in the 900s, and Bukhari was completely correct. This is exactly what everyone always says. That the, the Quran is eternal, but the, when I recite it in the world, that is a created sound. They said... No, no, no. You, you have to just saying that even the sound or the writing is created means you're a heretic. And Bukhari, interestingly, wrote a book rebutting them. And in it, he says, you don't understand the position of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. He's write this book of within 15 years of the death of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And he says, you know, I study with Ahmed ibn Hanbal. I can tell you, you don't understand his dikkat madhabihi, the exact exactness of his position on this. And he's basically saying, you don't, you don't understand what you're talking about. You're attributing all these 
opinions to Ahmed ibn Hanbal and that he would say this, that, and the other. And he didn't say this. What I'm saying is correct. But anyway, he's driven from Nishapur by Dhuhli. Later on, it's because Dhuhli doesn't like his position on the, 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 the wording of the Quran, created wording of the Quran. But it seems like the earlier version is that Dhuhli said, when I went to Mecca, I saw Bukhari and he was hanging out with a guy who believed in free will. And that was unacceptable. So then he goes to Bukhara, back to his native, you know, his hometown. And the Tahirid Emir, the Emir of the Tahirid dynasty, dynasty, a guy named Khalid bin Ahmed, I think his name is. He has at his court, he kind of has a coterie of Sunni Hadith scholars that, who, whom he's cultivating. By this time, the, the, the Mehna is over, right? So the Mehna doesn't affect Bukhari. The Mehna is uh, kind of over by, the, by this time. So uh, and and Sunni scholars are sort of in ascendance. The the caliphs and the local courts really want to have a lot, you know, want to bring Sunni scholars and and patronize them and enjoy their support. So uh, this uh, Tahir Amir in Bukhara has a bunch of scholars that he's kind of patronizing and um, giving, you know, helping them write their books and things. And he asked Bukhari to give private reading of his works to the the Tahir Amir's sons, to his own sons. And Bukhari says, I don't, I, I don't do that kind of thing. Not going to give your kids special treatment, and uh, he gets expelled from the city. And then he, there's this really moving thing that's attributed to him, where he says, you know, uh, he's on the road, you know, traveling around Khorasan. He says, "Daqat al Ard alayya." You know, the the earth has become too narrow for me, and he's sort of almost like there's no place for him anymore. And he on, is on the road to Samarkand, the other great city of Transoxiana, and he dies near the city in a place called Khartank, which is now a part of Samarkand. And uh, he's buried there. And his you can go visit his grave today. He dies in 256 or 870 of the common era, around 60 years old. Al-Bukhari is best known for his Sahih collection. Before we look at that in detail, describe to us his other works. Yeah, so Bukhari is a, you know, he actually wrote a number of works and, and a lot of them have survived. Unlike a lot of the other uh, scholars, like for example, Muslim, very few of his works have survived. So Bukhari, when, when he's in Mecca and Medina, his first writings are about collecting the sayings of companions of the Prophet. And then he starts writing a book called the Tariq al-Kabir, which is a collection of it ends up being about 12,300 entries of, it's a biographical dictionary of Hadith transmitters, right? Um, it's kind of placing them in the network of Hadith transmission, who met who, who narrated to who, when did someone live, who, what was their name, maybe some information about them, maybe a, a rating about whether they're reliable or not. And actually, this is the book that Bukhari is originally known for. So it's re really only until, let's say, before the kind of 920s or 930s, so 50 or 60 years after his death, he's only known for his Tariq al-Kabir. The first kind of written response to him by Ibn Abi Hatim al-Razi uh, died in 938, I think. He wrote a, a kind of rebuttal or criticism of the Tariq al-Kabir. Uh, that's the first book that, that gets talked about. He wrote another book of a large book of hadith of hadith transmitters that he criticized of people who were criticized kitab du'afa al-kabir which has been lost but which late which survived through at least the 1300s he wrote these rebuttals of the rebuttal about the, the criticisms on his position on the wording of the quran he wrote that rebuttal of the hanafi position on not raising your hand in prayer in hands in prayer he wrote a rebuttal of the hanafi position that you don't have to recite the fatiha if the imam leading the prayer recites it, you don't have to recite it out loud or even mentally in your head. Uh, he also wrote uh, a few other, uh, he wrote a, a small book of weak hadith transmitters. So those are the the, the works he's known for. Yeah. Um, okay, so Sahih Bukhari is an incredible book. I mean, it's, um, it's a kind of book where you look at it and you just say, oof, I mean, uh, that's the reaction I have with it. Oof, I don't know. I don't know. This book is too much. It's just a, it's a, it's a mammoth accomplishment. It's a, first of all, it's huge. I mean, it's a, a good, you know, 1.5 times bigger than 
the next biggest hadith collection of the six books. I mean, it's a it's a really big book, and it's comprehensive in its scope. It's basically the gospel according to Bukhari. It's the the world and Islam according to Bukhari. Everything in it. I mean, everything. So it's got, of course, everything about Islamic law. It's got extensive discussions of Islamic theology, which, by the way, you don't find in a lot of other books. Uh, let's say the six books. You don't find a lot of theology, or theological discussions. It has history. It has sections on how you transmit hadiths. It has sections essentially on hermeneutics, legal and theological hermeneutics. It's, it's comprehensive. So the book is not actually a hadith collection. Unlike, let's say, the collection of a Tirmidhi or Muslim Ahmed ibn Hanbal or the Sahih Muslim, it's basically Bukhari's opinion on all these issues I just talked about. And the evidence he gives are the hadiths. So the book is his opinions on all these things, and his opinions are expressed in the chapter titles and the subchapter titles, which can sometimes run for a whole page. His subchapter titles, sometimes little mini essays, where he's basically very elliptically, sometimes clearly, sometimes not clearly, giving you an, a discussion on a certain topic where he's going to promote his position and criticize others. And then the hadiths in the subchapter, in the bab, those are the actual evidence. So that is the, the sahih. I mean, it, it is a, an incredibly, it's an awe-inspiring book. I will say this about this. It's awe-inspiring. And anybody who, who doesn't think that, I don't care if you think this stuff is all made up or if you think Bukhari was deluded. You know, if you look at this book and you are not incredibly impressed then you either then you haven't really looked at it. Then you're just reading like a page or something. But I don't think it's possible for someone to look at this book and not be dumbstruck by the intricacy. He will narrate oftentimes a mostly multiple versions of a hadith in the book at different points in the book to make different points. And the number of narrations he includes is amazing. I mean, he will sometimes have exactly the same hadith with exactly the same chain of transmission, but just change the teacher that he hears it from directly. Like he's just trying to show you the breadth of his narrations that he has the com he has command of. I mean, it's really incredible. I should also say that this is the first book of its kind in the sense that it was the first book that restricted itself to sahih hadith, to sound hadith, to hadith that the author believed had sound or only sound and reliable chains of transmission. Uh, people might be surprised by this because they think, you know, Hadith sciences and Hadith criticism is all about authenticating Hadiths and things like that. That's true. But until this time, no one had written a book that was, that only included Sahih Hadiths. So if you look, let's say this, the Musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Bukhari's teacher, it has lots of Hadiths in there that are, have unreliable change of transmission. Now, they might be in there because they're the, the best thing the author could find on that topic. They might be in there because there, yes, there might be a, a problem in the chain of transmission, but there's so many different chains of transmission for that, that sort of, they sort of strengthen one another, or maybe, you know, it's on a topic that's not super important, like um, some extra prayer, you can say, uh, you know, at nighttime to, to get something specific from God. They know this is a, an invocation, you can say, or a litany. So these were not really considered to be important issues. So, But Bukhari's book is not like that. Although he doesn't have an introduction to the book. Muslim has an introduction to his book. Uh, Bukhari does not have an introduction. We only know about what he intended from reports attributed to him and then from actually reading the book itself. But Bukhari and Muslim are the first people who write books where they say, that they don't say this, but they're in effect what they're saying is, we don't care if a certain hadith is important in law. We don't care if it's got a lot of other isnads that strengthen its bad isnad. If it doesn't have an isnad, a chain of transmission that we think meets our standards of authenticity, it's not going in the book. So the 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 you know the interesting thing about let's say Sahih Bukhari Muslim is that if you're looking for a lot of important hadiths 
about law, just basic hadiths about Islamic law. You will not find them in Bukhari Muslim books. They're not in there because those, a lot of those hadiths are not, they do not actually have sahih chains of transmission. It doesn't mean they're not reliable. It just means that there's, their reliability doesn't come from single chains of transmission. So these are the first books to do that. And this actually is a big controversy. And I think we might talk about that later when we talk about the reception of the books. There has been continued doubts cast on how authentic are the traditions recorded in Al-Bukhari's Sahih. What are broader considerations and premises that should be borne in mind when trying to reconcile these views and where should listeners go next to learn more about Al-Bukhari and his yeah. works? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing that which I think is very interesting, right? With the, that the, the first responses to Sahih Bukhari and to Sahih Muslim are negative. They're from other Hadith scholars, other Sunni scholars, especially that, that network of, that uh, clan of scholars in Ray, Abu Zura al-Razi, Abu Hatim al-Razi, Ibn Wara. They are not happy with these books. They say, and, but they're not for the reasons you might think, right? They're upset about two things. They say, one, no one's done this before. And these are conservative people. They don't do things that no one's done before. Right. They, and if they just the idea, let's say, of criticizing Hadith transmitters, they had to really make arguments that this was a legitimate activity. And that it wasn't like backbiting and slander. So they're very conservative about, you know, they don't just start writing a new type of book because, you know, no one's done this before. It's exactly the opposite of like, you know, modern ideas of prizing uh, innovation for innovation's sake, you know. Uh, the second reason is that they saw it as dangerous because they were very worried that their opponents, like their like Mu'tazilite opponents, would say, oh, you want to use this hadith in an argument against me, but I just looked at this book of Sahih hadiths and this hadith is not in there. So I don't think you all really think this hadith is reliable. So they were concerned that Bukhari and Muslims' books were going to give the impression that if a hadith was not in their books, it was not sahih. And so, in fact, Muslim Bukhari, it's attributed to him by uh, in the work of Ibn Adi about 100 years later, that he said, there are lots of hadiths that are sahih that are not in my book. I didn't put everything that I think is sahih in there in my book. I just put the hadiths that I think are useful for my points I'm trying to make. Similarly, Muslim actually in his Sahih, in his chapter on the Tashahud, the Tashahud, uh, the thing you say when you're seated during prayer, he says, I did not put all the hadiths I think are Sahih in this book. I only put the hadiths that people have, they, he doesn't say who they are, that they have come to consensus on as Sahih. Uh, so they, they're, they're really forced to defend themselves against this accusation. And it's really only maybe half a century after their deaths, that, that Sunni scholars really embrace their books and see them as incredible accomplishments that need to be studied and and modeled and and kind of role, and become role models for uh, for later books. Well, I mean, there's two things that I should talk about. One is the criticism of Bukhari and Muslim by Muslim scholars, which starts early and doesn't stop, right? And the second one is you know, how we, quote unquote, we would say what's authentic and not. Those are two different issues. As I said, when we talk about kind of criticism of Bukhari and Muslims books, or let's just talk about Bukhari's book, right? So the first thing to know is that Muslim scholars have always criticized these books, right? There's no, they, not only are they, they criticized early on, but they're, they're criticized by people who admire the books. For example, Ismaili, who died in um, 381, 991 of the Common Era, I'm just, top of my head. He's a Hadith scholar from Georgian, kind of south eastern shore of the Caspian Sea. And he has, an, you know, he's an early scholar of Bukhari's works. You know, he's more rationalist than Bukhari. He doesn't like, there's one Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, which where Abraham is uh, saying, you know, to God, uh, don't humiliate me on the day of judgment by kind of punishing my father for his unbelief and for his idolatry. And Ismaili says this, this is a uh, can't really be reliable because Abraham knew that God was going to punish his father for his polytheism. And he knows that the father deserves this. And it's not 
it, it's not possible for him to consider this as an insult or humiliation. So there's a couple of instances where where Ismaili will sort of push back against things that he thinks are theologically problematic in Sahih Bukhari. Although Ismaili is a Sunni, right? Just like Bukhari, he's just a there's a he's a little bit more maybe a rationalist about theological matters. There's a lot more criticism, by the way, of hadiths in, in Sahih Muslim. But in his Kitab al Mawdu'at, his book of forged hadith, Ibn al Jawzi, who dies 1201 of the Common Era, has one hadith from Sahih Muslim in there and two hadiths from Sahih Bukhari. And Ibn Hazm died 1064. He has a little treatise on there's two hadiths from Bukhari and two hadiths from Muslims that he thinks cannot be accepted. The one in, in Bukhari is a narration of Shuraik of the Prophet going to have having the Mi'raj, the miraculous trip to heaven, when he was a child. He doesn't say this is contradicts the, what we know about the timeline of the Prophet's life. And there's two in Sahih Muslim, I think. One is about Muawiyah saying when he converts to Islam, one of the conditions is that the Prophet has to marry his daughter, Um Habiba. But the Prophet had already been married to her, like for years. And the second one is, yeah, I think that's, I think it's just one actually in each book, if I'm not mistaken. Also, uh, there is criticism of the hadith in Sahih Bukhari that when God created Adam in paradise, Adam was uh, 60 arms tall, like 60 cubits tall. And this is mentioned by uh, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, he died uh, 1351 in his Manar al Munif on forged hadiths. And it's Ibn uh, Hajar al Asqalani discusses it. He doesn't say it's forged, but he just says, I don't know how to resolve this problem because it says Adam was 60 arms tall. Then humans have been shrinking ever since then. But uh, he says, you know, you go and you find these ancient buildings like the houses of Ad and Thamud that are carved into the rock of Wadi al-Qura in the Hejaz. And the doors are the same size as our doors. So it doesn't make sense that they're shrinking. But he just says, I don't know. I have not found anything that resolves this, but he doesn't have, you know, given opinion about whether it's reliable or not. But uh, You'll find a lot of uh, Sunni scholars would say that hadith is is an example of a forged hadith. The Hanafis are, although eventually they acknowledge the value of Sahih Bukhari and write lots of commentaries on Sahih Bukhari, especially in India, you know, any scholar worth their salt in the 1700s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s is going to write a commentary on either Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim. But they, you'll still see, for example, uh, one scholar, Ibn Abi al-Wafa al-Qurashi, who dies in about 1375, He's from Cairo. He has this section in one of his books where he just goes off on Bukhari and Muslim. He says, these books, they get way too much praise. And uh, Bukhari, you know, has this hadith of the one I just mentioned about the trip to Jerusalem. A Muslim has this hadith about God created the earth on a Saturday when Saturday is the seventh day of the week. And God, the Quran says that God created the earth in six days. And then he tells a story, which is... Also, actually, it comes from an earlier Hanafi scholar named Asarachsi, the famous jurist and legal theoretician, died around 1096 of the Common Era. In Asarachsi's Mabsut, he has a story where Bukhari allegedly is in Bukhara, and he's asked about this question about people who drink milk from the same goat. And he says, if you drink milk from the same goat, you become a milk sibling with the other person who drank milk from that goat, which is a ridiculous opinion, okay? And... All the, you know, Abu Hafs al-Kabir, the great Hanafi scholar of the, the city, says this is ridiculous, and Bukhari kind of gets driven out of town. This story is not true. And later, Hanafi scholars like Abdul Hay al-Laknawi, who died in 1887, the great Hanafi scholar from Lucknow, he says that this story is made up. But you see it, you know, repeated in Han some Hanafi sources. I think not only are they kind of maybe trying to get back a little bit of, against Bukhari, who had disagreed so vehemently with the founder of of the Hanafi school of law on law, but also it was in a way to make this point, which we see often discussed, which is that there should be this division of labor between the Hadith scholars and the jurists. And that Hadith scholars job is to basically process and authenticate Hadiths, but then not to get involved in giving legal opinions or trying to figure out how to interpret those Hadiths. And you see this attributed to Abu Hanifa and other early scholars that you know, the Hadith scholars are the pharmacists and the jurists are the doctors. The pharmacists just make the drugs and get it ready. And the, only the doctors know how to prescribe it and how to use it. 
So I think that's also trying to make this point, which you see often in the polemics between kind of more juristically inclined people and more maybe hadith inclined people, all the way up until, you know, Salafi versus Mehdi debates today. It's really important to keep in mind that these scholars all uh, criticized Sahih Bukhari, but, you know, they're, they're talking about, you know, one or two or three hadiths in, in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. I mean, you're talking about an insignificant portion of the books. Now, a scholar named Dara Qutni, a great hadith scholar from Baghdad who died in 995 of the Common Era, he wrote a, a book where he criticized I, about if I, uh, 217 hadiths. 78 of them were from Bukhari, and 36 of them were in Bukhari and Muslims' books. But these criticisms are extremely arcane, uh, detailed criticisms of specifics in the chains of transmission. They have nothing to do with the contents of the hadiths. Uh, and mostly they don't even affect the reliability of the general hadith on that topic. Like it'll be like Bukhari gives three narrations and one of his narrations is missing a person in the Asnad that should be there. That doesn't affect anything because, I mean, there's still two other narrations in the, the book. Uh, they're very, it's sort of very, very uh, almost nitpicky um, hadith criticism. But when we talk about even kind of criticizing, criticizing the meaning of hadiths in Bukhari and Muslim and saying that meaning can't be accepted, Muslim scholars do that, but it's it's a very small number of hadiths in the books, and it's not it's not it's not controversial to do that until the early modern period, and really until the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, because at that point, criticizing Bukhari and Muslim, who are seen as sort of like the exemplars of the Sunni hadith science and the best of the tradition, criticizing them is seen as a way, a means, or presents a danger of delegitimizing Islamic tradition as a whole. And I remember a scholar saying this, and when I was in grad school, a Muslim scholar told me this. He said, you know, if you, if you reject Abu Huraira as a transmitter, you reject Sahih Bukhari. If you reject Sahih Bukhari, you reject the Sharia. Now, in one sense, that's not true at all. Like Bukhari, had, I think Abu Huraira has about 446 narrations in Sahih Bukhari, maybe, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, you could have Sahih Bukhari and just take out the narrations of Abu Huraira if you wanted. Certainly, the Sharia is not based on Sahih Bukhari. No no school of law or theology started by their founder picking up Sahih Bukhari and saying, okay, well, let's let's figure out what the Sharia is. What the, the scholar meant when they said that is the methodology that Bukhari represents, the idea of being able to create an authentic representation of the Sunnah of the Prophet, if you can't do that, you lose your religion. And this, by the way, is something that was said in debates between the Mu'tazilites and the Sunnis, even going back to the late, you know, uh, 700s. One uh, debate by this guy, Omar bin Habib, in the Abbasid court, is a Sunni scholar, he dies in 204, 820 of the Common Era. And there, uh, He's debating with some Mu'tazilites and sort of Hanafi jurists in the court of the Caliph. And there, the Mu'tazilites are criticizing the narrations from Abu Huraira, saying Abu Huraira is not reliable. And Omar bin Habib says, if you don't trust the companions of the Prophet, you don't have a link to the Prophet. You do not have a way of transmitting the Sharia from the Prophet if you can't trust the companions. Now, the difference between, let's say, the juristic school of let's just say the Hanafis in this case, and the early Sunnis, the Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah, is not, no one wanted to lose the Sharia, but someone like the Ahl al would say, we believe that the Sunnah of the Prophet is transmitted through hadiths that are consistent, reasonable, fit into a system of analogy and legal reasoning. That's how you know the Sunnah of the Prophet. Whereas the, the early Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah, the early Sunnis, they said, no, no, no. This legal reasoning you're talking about is should not have a primary role in preserving and understanding the sunnah. Basically, you go back, you collect all the hadiths you can, and then you put these pieces together, and that composite image is going to give you the best image, the best understanding of the sunnah of the Prophet. So they weren't really diametrically opposed to one another. They just had differing visions about the best way to preserve and understand the sunnah. But the, the point that that scholar is making is that whether you're, you're Hanafi or a Shafi or whatever, or a jurist or a Hadith scholar, that Sahih Bukhari by the modern period comes to represent that 
ability, that su- that success, that Muslim success in preserving the Sunnah of the Prophet. And if you challenge him and the consensus around him as the, the acme of the Hadith critical process, that you endanger the entire tradition. So you kind of cut the legs out from the entire tradition and you no longer have a consensus about what the prophet said and did, even a core of things that he said and did that you can kind of have as the basis of your religion. And so it's seen as creating a door for especially Orientalist criticism of the Hadiths, that if you kind of say that Bukhari is can be criticized, that now anything can be criticized and that uh, you know, Western critics, uh, scholars of Islam are going to come in and do to the Islamic tradition what they did to the biblical tradition. And that that was it. So that's why in the modern period of Bukhari and Muslim become such beyond criticism, that criticism of them is sort of sem- seen as semi-heretical. So I think that, you know, when we talk about criticism of Bukhari and Muslim, I think on the one hand, there's the question of kind of Muslims, the kind of the idea that Muslims are engaged in this constant process of reevaluation and study. And that never stops. Like Imam Shafi said, no book is complete except the book of God. You know, no book is free of error and no book is immune to criticism. But the issue around criticizing Bukhari Muslim or Sahih Bukhari, especially in the modern period, is sensitive because Bukhari becomes like a symbol of the Islamic tradition and criticizing it is seen as an attack on the the integrity of that tradition, especially because it's understood as being an attack that is motivated or based on outside uh, premises, outside epistemologies, whether it's kind of a Western-influenced Islamic modernism or a kind of Western Orientalist criticism. So that's why in the modern period, there's a lot more sensitivity about criticizing Sahih Bukhari than there was, you know, 400 years ago. Now, you know, one of the questions was, what does Dr. Brown think about the hadiths in Sahih Bukhari? And are there any hadiths in Sahih Bukhari that are untrue? I think that this question is, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to put down the person who asked the question, but I, I think it's a, the question is, it's con- it, the way it's conceived is based on uh, false premises. Uh, first of all, there are all sorts of things in Bukhari. I mean, it depends how you define true, right? I mean, did the prophet actually say this thing or not? That's one way you could think about truth. And in that case, there's all sorts of things in Sahih Bukhari that can't be true because Bukhari includes different narrations of the same event. So he'll include three different narrations of, let's say, the Prophet Salam giving his speech, uh, telling uh, Muslims what to do when they arrive in Mecca for their Hajj, should they leave the state of pilgrimage after they do the Umrah until Hajj starts again or not? Or uh, what exactly did he say to them? Like there's different narrations. They all have the same general idea, but he says the wording is different. So those things can't all be true. The prophet said one of those things or he didn't. Now, by true, you mean, are these different narrations representing kind of different aspects or different manifestations of a certain event that happened, a certain moment in the life of the prophet? And that that moment is true. Again, I think really depends on your premises. I mean, how do you decide what's true or not? When Ibn Hazm or others said that they had a problem with a report of the prophet that describes his miraculous journey to Jerusalem occurring when he was a child, that is a fair criticism, right? Because we know that from many other reports that are agreed upon with consensus that the Isra and Mi'raj happened when the prophet was an adult, after he's a prophet. So if you have a report that says something else, then there has to be some kind of misunderstanding. Maybe there's an error in one of the transmitters said. And by the way, I mean, if you read Fath al-Bari ibn Hajar al-Asqalani or any other hadith commentary, there are, I'm just going to guess, probably 20 or 30 instances in Sahih Bukhari where Ibn Hajar, who is a you know devoted Sunni scholar, right, uh, who's not a uh, radical, who's not uh, maverick in any way, he'll say this narration is mistaken. There's a mistake in this narration. There has to be an error. Maybe one of the transmitters got confused because it says something that we know is not reliable. In every instance that I know of in Sahih Bukhari, that is a one narration of several narrations. 
So the Sahih Bukhari has many narrations about the Asra and Miraj, and one of them has this problem of when it occurs. So you could say maybe that narration is a mistake. Now, there are other things where it's, a, it's maybe expanding the circle of criticism outward. Someone says, I have a problem with this hadith. For example, the age of Aisha when she gets married. The Aisha, you know, the prophet consummated his marriage with Aisha when she was nine years old. And I know that there's some, there's been this controversy in the UK where this one uh, scholar in the UK has launched into all these attacks on Sahih Bukhari because it has this hadith in it about Aisha saying she was nine years old when the prophet consummated his marriage to her. Again, what are our premises? I understand that this hadith makes people uncomfortable because we live in a, in, in a time and in societies where we consider nine-year-olds to be children who are or not sexual beings and that it's sort of morally and legally disgusting to us that someone would have a sexual relationship, even a consensual one with someone who's nine years old. And by the way, people would say that a nine-year-old couldn't consent to begin with because they're not an adult. But those are our premises. But those are our premises. Those have nothing to do with the rest of human history, right? So we know from the Quran that the enemies of the prophet looked at his sex life at, for ways to undermine his claims to be a messenger of God, right? So for example, in the Quran, the, in, the instance of the divorce of Zayd and Zainab and the prophet's marriage to Zainab. This is referred to in the Quran, and he's attacked for this. How could you marry somebody who was the wife of your adopted son? And the Quran then talks about the true nature of adoption. The polemics, whether it's from Christians in the Middle East or Christians in Europe, for 1,300 years are full of discussions of the Prophet's sex life. It's one of the main ways that enemies of Islam, critics of Islam, polemics against Islam, attack the Prophet's legitimacy. None of them talk about the age of Aisha until the year 1905 is the first instance where you see a book say, hey, the Prophet married this girl who's really young. Why? Because nobody cared about that before. Because people in the United States were marrying 12-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 13-year-olds in the early 20th century. You know, the age of consent in places like Georgia was like 10 years old. So, and even in the UK. So uh, what are our premises? Like, for example, there's another hadith. Ibn Taymiyyah criticizes Bukhari's book for this too. He says there's, there's a hadith where the prophet is uh, marries Maymuna, the aunt of Ibn Abbas, when he's muhrim, when he's in a state of pilgrimage. This is problematic. And there's, you know, Muslim scholars discuss this stuff. I don't want to get into the details. But, you know, it's... People have various ways of responding to this criticism or not. But things like that, things where you're talking about the the when the Isra and the Mi'raj happen, these are criticisms that where the premises come from within the Islamic tradition. Like the criticism of Sahih in Sahih Muslim of the hadith that says that the God created the turba, the dirt, on Saturday. Well, the Quran says God created the world in six days. So how does that make sense? That's, you're taking the Quran and you're saying this hadith seems to contradict the Quran. And it's agreed upon by Sunni hadith scholars. You go back to any book of hadith criticism till the 10 hundreds of the common era, as far back as the 10 hundreds, you'll see the rule. It's always the same. If hadith contradicts the Quran, if it contradicts the established sunnah, if it contradicts the first principles of reason, if it contradicts consensus, it can't be something the Prophet said. Now, of course, you have to be willing to look at ways to reconcile this, right? So someone could say, Oh, the Quran says that dead animals are prohibited to you, but the prophet allowed people to eat a, a dead whale that was on the beach. Look, it's contradicting the Quran. No, it's not contradicting the Quran. It's specifying the Quran by saying that the Quran's commandment about dead animals has to do with an land animals, not animals in the, in the sea. But my point is that the idea that you reject a hadith because it contradicts the Quran unambiguously. This is not controversial. All, all Muslims agree with this, as far as I know. Right? But one, how quick are you to do this? Are you willing to think about ways that you can reconcile this hadith with the Quran or with other aspects of the Sunnah or with reason? A lot of modern criticism of the hadith tradition or Sahih Bukhari is based on a unwillingness to grant any charity at all to attributions to the prophet and to just dismiss them out of hand 
because they don't immediately accord with your tastes or your predilections of the world. And then it becomes even more problematic when the premises that you're using to judge or the criteria, the criterion of probity that you're using to judge the reliability of hadith is not based in any way in the Quran, in the Islamic tradition at all. So when someone comes and says, you know, the age of Aisha, this is based on a, your, people object to this based on changes in human society that have happened in the last hundred years. And no one is saying like, I don't know any Muslim scholars who think that someone has to marry their nine-year-old daughter or something. In fact, it's entirely legitimate, entirely legitimate, and has been done in, in many Muslim countries with complete compliance with the Sharia, that a government can say, we're going to restrict marriage age and say that you, we're not going to register marriages with people until, let's say, they're 18 or 16. This is fine. This is what's called taqeed al-mubah, restriction of the permissible, for the maslaha or the benefit of the Muslim community. That's completely fine. But to then go back in time and say that because of our changes in economics and society, we're going to say that something the pro that attributed to the Prophet could never have happened when no one said that. Even the, the, the Prophet's biggest enemies, no one ever brought this up for 1400 years or 1300 years. That is a, a criticism. I, I think that that kind of that's so that's that an anachronism is, uh, first of all, it's from a scholarly perspective, it's absurd because there's no way that a historian, any historian worth their salt would say that we're going to decide what story is probable or improbable in the past based on what we, our values are today. And from a, a kind of more of a sort of confessional perspective, it's, I think, highly problematic to say that you're going to constantly adjust what you think happened in the life of your prophet based on changes every couple of years to what people think is appropriate in our time and place. I th think the question of criticizing Hadith and say Bukhari is really any of that discussion should start with what are people's premises? What are the basis for the criticisms they're making? Uh, so that would be my answer. You are the author of Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy, Slavery and Islam, and other works. What are other current projects that listeners can anticipate? Okay, um, well, I've been working on one book for a couple of years now, maybe, geez, you know, five, six years. It's mostly done, but I, have to, I, can, I can never get around to finishing it. It's called the Justice and Islamic Law, History of Madhalam Courts and Legal Reform, which is really a kind of a book about what do you, what do Muslims do when they, they feel there's a conflict between or a kind of a mismatch between their bodies of law and the expectations of justice. So that's how do Muslims handle that institutionally, how they handle it theoretically. That book is mostly done, but I, I just can't get around to finishing it because other stuff keeps coming up. The slavery book I wrote because of the, the ISIS thing. And uh, I'm now almost done with a book. It's called Is, is Islam Anti-Black? And it's about the discussion around Islam and uh, racism and especially anti-blackness. And I am looking at kind of Islamic law and uh, scripture and how, how one answers this question. Short answer, Islam is not anti-black. That's, that's the short answer. But uh, you get to read the book for uh, more, more details on that. Dr. Brown, thank you for being a guest on the Abbasid History Podcast. <music>